Hi, and welcome to today's Engaging for Missouri webinar. I'm Alice Roach from the Division of Applied Social Sciences at the University of Missouri, and I will be your host today. With each of these 30-minute webinars, we intend to share research-based insights that leaders like you can apply in your own work to benefit and strengthen the state's agriculture and food system, hospitality sector, and communities. Today, Dr. Kerry Clark will speak about modernizing agricultural mechanization in Ghana, or rather in Africa. And before I invite Dr. Clark to begin, I want to share a few housekeeping notes. First, we'll close today's presentation with a Q&A session. Those of you who connected by phone may submit their questions in the chat screen, or rather if you submitted your questions in the chat screen, you can do that um, if you're on Zoom. And if you are on um, your phone, you can do that via email at roacham.missouri.edu. Second, all attendees are muted and may not start their video. And if you encounter any technical problems today, then you can please let me know by submitting a comment in the chat screen, or you can send me an email at roacham.missouri.edu. And last, we'll make a recording of today's presentation available. You can um, access that recording in a message that Zoom sends you tomorrow. And you can also access an archive of all of our previous Engaging for Missouri webinars on our Division of Applied Social Sciences YouTube channel. So with that, we'll transition to the topic of today's webinar, which is titled Modernizing Agricultural Mechanization in Africa to Meet Global Food Demand. Presenting is Dr. Kerry Clark, who's an assistant research professor of rural sociology and the College of Agriculture, Food, and Natural Resources International Programs Director. So thank you, Kerry, for presenting today. If you could please go ahead and unmute your microphone, you can begin your presentation. Thank you, Alice. I hope everybody can hear me. So good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, to start out with, I want to give you guys a little bit of background about what I'm going to be talking about. In 2013, the U.S. Agency for International Development, which is a division in, under the Department of State, established the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Soybean Value Chain Research, which we call the Soybean Innovation Lab, or SIL. The purpose of this was to fill the technical void underlying low yield and low profitability among sub-Saharan African soybean producers. SIL's mission is to provide technologies and technical training to practitioners to ensure a sustainable soybean system in Sub-Saharan Africa. Improving soybean productivity and utilization in Sub-Saharan Africa can lead to improved human nutrition, reduced childhood stunting, higher farm income, and greater economic growth and political stability. In addition to benefits of U.S. international development funding to Africans, there's also benefits to the U.S. and Missouri. Uh, Alice, how do I move my, it's not, oh, there we go, okay. Um, so to go over a few of those benefits, which are important because USAID is funded by U.S. taxpayers. So some of the things that SIL has done to benefit U.S. farmers and Missouri farmers um, we've evaluated plant pests in Africa. We've identified new soybean diseases, which forewarns U.S. soybean researchers how to develop um, combatant strategies before those diseases get here. Our research in tropical ad adaptation of soybean enables our soybean breeding germplasm to become more diversified worldwide, which increases our genetic variability and improves our chances of continued U.S. improvements in yield and pest resistance. Our effort in, in incorporating soybean into African diets and animal feeding operations increases demand for soybean. This demand is unlikely to be met solely through domestic production. So U.S. soybean exports to Africa have increased room for market growth. Um, we are also helping U.S. farms and farmers to identi identify um, and serve new markets. And because soybean is both a commercial and nutrition crop, its production can raise standards of living leading to more stable societies and governments and increased global security. And as you guys have seen, sometimes when people don't have enough food, we have food riots around the world, which and we've, that has led to governments being overthrown, which is not good for any country. And then as incomes rise in the sub-Saharan Africa from the production of value chain crops such as soybean, the demand for consumer and industrial goods exported from the U.S. will also increase. When we started working in Africa, we found that there was a link in the soybean and really all crop value chain that's missing. And that is the use of agricultural mechanization. So currently human powered land preparation, planting, weeding, harvest and threshing leads to high personal energy demands and results in exhaustion and high caloric expenditures for farmers, many of who include women and children. And those children often have to be taken out of school to do this work.
Oh, Alice, I can't get out of the video go to the next. Okay, here we are. Sorry. Um, so that video probably seemed to go on forever, but it was actually only 30 seconds of a two-week process for these children beating the crops. And these women and children in the photo above uh, who separate the chaff from the grain after stick beating. So that is two weeks for one acre of production. So what can be done to help this serious problem? This serious situation in Africa. First, we need support of the local of local manufacturing. Imports help farmers, but they don't build an agricultural and industrial sector, which is needed to create jobs and a value chain that ensures equipment can also be serviced and maintained. To build local manufacturing, there first needs to be plans made available for African fabricators. The public sector must support the private sector by assisting with research and development, which is currently unaffordable and a major roadblock for many equipment commercialization efforts in Africa. So the public uh, sector has the money to do the research, um, while the, the private does not, but the private, the private sector is needed for scale up and commercialization. Secondly, the public sector, sector must support training and human capacity development for agricultural mechanization. Many failed government schemes from the past decades have made public funders a little shy when it comes to mechanization. However, success can be attained by focusing on private sector development and augmenting the current skills and ingenuity of African manufacturers. In addition to skills, good tools and investments are needed. For mechanization to be successful in Africa, there needs to be industries that can fabricate, provide maintenance, and provide replacement parts. With industrialization, jobs will be created, helping to raise people out of poverty. Income creation will increase the ability for purchasing of more mechanization, and will provide opportunities for subsistence farmers to become commercial farmers. Africa is home to many ingenious, industrious people who are currently hindered by unavailability of credit at reasonable rates, lack of investment in infrastructure, and market disincentives such as exorbitant taxes on the formal sector and government subsidies for imports, which dampers local drive to create an industrial sector. These issues need to, be, need to be addressed concurrently with human capacity development and value chain development. Currently, the work to improve mechanization in Africa is not driven so much by farmers as it is by food and feed manufacturers who cannot get, get enough commodities to make their factories fully functional and profitable. The poultry industry, as well as the aquaculture and soy foods are major proponents of developing an agricultural mechanization industry so that farmers are no longer limited by hand planting, hand harvest and hand threshing. The food and feed industry is supporting the development of a service provision sector for agricultural mechanization. Before World War II, service provision was a method in the United States, service provision was a method of serving the many small to medium sized farms that we had in our country. Not every farmer had the resources or the need to own expensive equipment. So custom operators would travel from farm to farm providing land tillage, cultivation, planting, and threshing. And my own grandparents were actually um, custom thresher operators, uh, and the thresher still sits on the farm, of course, unused now. Um, you also still see this quite commonly in um, the Western states of the United States where acreage may be too small to support the purchase of a combine for individual farms. 
The service provision is a very important aspect of, me of mechanizing agriculture. Africa is starting to move in that same direction. So service provision will help smallholder and subsistence farmers become commercial growers as it provides inexpensive access to the equipment needed to increase acreage and production. In service provision, the cost of equipment is borne by many and access to it can bring positive outcomes in the form of increased production, increased yields, and reduced post-harvest loss. In addition to training for fabrication, the public sector can also support the private sector by training end users of equipment. So service providers need to know how to properly use equipment and they benefit from business development training. I once spoke to a large rice company in Ethiopia who'd started using imported combines, but abandoned them after the first season because they were suffering high seed loss. They were completely unfamiliar with the equipment. The people involved had not grown up around equipment, probably not even cars or motorcycles um, at that point. So there was not a culture of mechanization or knowledge of how equipment runs. And so because they were completely unfamiliar with the equipment, they did not realize that they could make a series of machine adjustments that would have fixed their problems. So when people grow up with a complete absence of machinery in their lives, equipment knowledge and skill may not be as intuitive as we take for granted. So to prevent machine graveyards and discarding equipment, training is needed. Tractors and threshers are logical places to start in mechanizing in Africa because land preparation and harvest are the most laborious and burdensome processes in agriculture. However, across many countries, rural people are fleeing to the lure of city jobs. So more demand, for both food and labor, is placed on farmers with less hands to do the work. Mechanization that we no longer have use for in the US would be an incredible boon for African farmers, such as this one row corn picker, probably from the 1940s. This picker could save people from hunger. It can allow acreages of production to increase and it can reduce harvest time by weeks or even months. This 1950s pull type combine is simple enough to be manufactured by small enterprises in Africa and it would be life-changing for farmers and agricultural businesses. These machines can create both jobs and food. Once a farmer can grow more than just what it takes to feed his or, his fa his or her family, excess can be sold to in increase the purchase of inputs, such as fertilizer and improved seed, that will help further increase yields. Currently, African yields per acre are just a fraction of their potential due to low input use. This 1960s planter can help improve plant density and seed emergence, which are major contributors to improved yield. The world can't afford for the continent with the largest farmable landmass to continue farming with a hoe and a stick. Creating an environment for mechanization to modernize African agriculture is imperative. Public sector support is needed to create an environment where the private sector can commercialize and scale modern agricultural mechanization to meet global food demand. So what can you do? Every US citizen has a stake in, in globally equitable food systems. One of the last um, big bipartisan efforts that our Congress made in April of 2016 was the Global Food Security Act, which ensured continued um, US support for research for development. So continued support of that will be necessary in the future. We also need engineers who can redesign old off patent equipment like the corn picker and the uh, pull type combine I just showed. Those need to be redesigned so that they can use modern off-the-shelf parts. Research and development is simple, in, in simple but impactful innovations and in equipment is needed. So simple planters, sim uh, we, we don't need to start with the most complex stuff, but simple things like um, you know, uh, the, the corn picker, uh, grinders, flour grinders, um, roasters, that kind of thing is all needed. And those plans don't really exist currently. 
Uh, so even though the equipment exists, nobody's actually put it on paper so that it can be passed off to, to, to new fabricators in other countries. We also need investment in credit and business product development. So um, there are some angel investors that, that do this kind of investment, uh, but um, right now interest rates in most African countries are around 30%. So we need new credit schemes uh, and new investment in that so that uh, manufacturers can purchase raw material to, to fabricate and so that people who want to become service providers can get credit to buy the, buy the equipment. And then we need to support public expenditures in science that help pr improve global agricultural productivity. So that is the end of my talk and we'll take questions now. Great. Thank you, Carrie, so much for providing that overview of your work. If you do have a question for Carrie, please go ahead and submit that in the chat screen. Or again, you can email me at roacham at missouri.edu. Um, Carrie, to kick off our discussion, I'm curious about what the cost of this mechanized equipment is for African farmers um, and how readily available they can make those investments. So if a local industrial sector were to develop, then would the machinery that they produce be available at a price that farmers could pay? So currently every machine is made by hand. Um, there's not much um, standardization in the fabrication process yet. So like each machine is cut out by hand. And so that of course raises costs for labor, although labor costs are extremely extremely um, low across Africa. So the, the, um, the, the thresher that I showed you that still works on, which is the, uh, the big, this big orange thresher, well, the screen one too, um, and that's blue one, that's all the same thresher. That will run retail about 45, anywhere from $3,500 to $4,500, depending on the market. Um, it's cheaper if you run it off a tractor PTO because the engine is almost a, probably a fifth of the cost. So if you run it off a tractor PTO, you don't have to buy the engine. However, the Swabian Innovation Lab has done research on um, the return on investment for this. And so for service providers that are, um, using about a three month harvest season, this pays itself off in one harvest season. So this thresher can make up to a hundred dollars a day gross. Um, and about, I think about $80 a day net when run at full capacity. Great, that's great context. Thank you for that. And so can you share with us a little bit more about this multi-crop thresher um, that SIL's worked on? What are other efforts that SIL has worked on in promoting mechanization too? So we also work with um, other thresher. So, so we have trained over 200 um, people across Africa in 10 different countries. Um, we have pretty good scale up and commercialization of threshers in Ethiopia, Zambia, Ghana, um, and, uh, and Tanzania. So um, some of those, some of the countries where we've trained, people haven't been so able to continue on with production because of that unavailability of credit and the high cost of credit. And so fabricators have a difficult time buying the raw materials. So the places where we have had success is where there's somebody able to get credit at a lower rate or they're backed by, as I mentioned, um, another business that needs the grain that the thresher pr produces. So for instance, in Zambia, um, there's an aquaculture company that is producing threshers because they need to source 10,000 metric tons of soybean every year to feed fish, and they can't do it with the whole hand system. Um, and then in Ethiopia, we had some uh, somebody who's worked in the cold value chain um, uh, decided to also invest in threshers because, again, they need the grain. So the thresher has been the major uh, focus of SIL up until now. Um, with COVID, we had to stop trainings, and so we've moved, and it was always our plan to also move into this, but the, 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 the pull-type combine that I showed in the planter are the current projects of SIL. So we're working on getting those plans on paper so that we can share with the uh, network of fabricators that we've developed across Africa. And then we'll work, the next phase, though, is to work getting them funding, financing, and credit so they can actually build the equipment. Great. Thank you for providing that background about the project. Uh, we have an attendee question here. Can you share about post-harvest loss using the thresher versus processing by hand? 
So I have a picture I didn't include in the slideshow, but um, when they beat that grain on the ground, as you saw in the video, very few people have tarps. Even if you have a tarp, it rips right away. So basically you're mixing the soil with the grain um, and cleaning that up is uh, very hard because there's a lot of little rocks that are exact same size as the soybean, maybe the same weight. Um, they use wind to winnow. So you end up with very, very high um, contamination levels in the beans. And in fact, in Ghana, that actually destroyed at, for some time the local uh, soybean production um, business because the feed and food processors were getting, they felt like they were getting ripped off when they buy a local soybean in the bag is maybe a quarter full of rock and stone. So they're buying by volume or weight and they're not getting all soybeans. So, um, and then they also have to install equipment that, that uh, further cleans. So you totally eliminate that contamination when you use a thresher. You also eliminate, um, I didn't show a video of it, but when they, after they beat and then they pick up the chaff by hand, a lot of seeds get stuck you know, in that chaff. And so you probably lose another 10 to 20% in the cleanup process that stays behind in the chaff or on the ground. So it's really significant how much it changes post-harvest loss. Yeah, thank you. Another attendee question here. Can you speak about the gender dimensions related to soybean production, consumption, and marketing? And how would the service be provided and at what cost? So, okay, so service provision is done differently in different countries, but for the most part across Africa, it's done as a percentage of grain that runs through the machine. So in most places it's 10%. So the farmer um, will bring his crop, either, you, the, either the machine goes to the farm or the farmer comes to the machine, they run their, their crop through. If they get a hundred bags, then 10 of the bags stay with the, the service provider. Um, that in maize is extremely lucrative uh, in soybeans because soybean feeds slower into the thresher. It's not quite as lucrative, but um, the farmer would also have to pay that 10 percent to for hand labor if he was hand harvesting. So for the farmer, it's a win win because he gets his crop much faster. It's much cleaner. It's easier to sell. Um, he doesn't have to feed and pay off the people who do the hand harvesting. Um, and then. Uh, I can't remember the first part of the question. So I, sure. I answered the service part. <laughs> sure, the gender dimensions portion. And oh, how gender. gender. Yes. Okay, so um, in soybean production in Africa, when it's when the soybean is being grown for, for commercial sell, it is often men that will do it, um, but women do participate and the women will usually grow it if they're growing it for their family to eat. And um, you know, unlike in the United States, where we never really figured out how to process soybean for you know use in our kitchens, um, it's more of a commercial food product. Uh, um, Africans do have many, many different ways that they utilize soybeans in their in their diets. So they do use it for at home um, nutrition. Um, on mechanization, one of the things we're trying to do is to make sure that women don't get shut out of mechanization. So we do have a, a, stu a, a study group of 20 women thresher owners in Ghana that we kind of follow to see how things are going. And we have an engine that has a key start. So this engine you see in the picture here, that's actually a, a, a crank start diesel engine, which is very hard to start. But we have one that's a key start with a starter that women can start. So we are encouraging um, women to become uh, either owners or, or service providers of, in some way or or to buy threshers as a group. Um, and that's what we have in Ghana. It's 20 women's groups that already were organized. They ran village savings and loan associations, and now they run their thresher operators or thresher owners. So they own the business, but they hire men to operate the machine. Um, so soybean hit, legumes in general tend to be um, crops that women grow very often in Africa. Um, and soybeans is the same. So uh, women are definitely accessing the, the soybean um, value chain in Africa. And in fact, we worked with a group called the Mennonite Economic Development Association who worked with 20,000 women in Ghana to grow soybeans. And, and they did very successfully. Awesome. Thank you for those responses. Um, are the farmers largely open to trying mechanized equipment in Africa? Or what are some barriers that may prevent them from wanting to adopt a mechanized piece of equipment? So the um, so most medium to large scale farmers will have mechanization. It's often just a tractor and a thresher. 
there may not be a planter or you know anything to spray chemical or cultivate or anything like that. It's usually a tractor and a thresher. The small guys, the main limitation is that there is no money. So that's where the service provision is incredibly important because the service provision steps in and does basically for the same cost of hand labor, but at a much, much faster pace. So um, the main barrier, and I, and I have a video of a great guy in Ghana saying, the biggest problem with this thresher is there's, there's not enough of them. Um, he says, my demand is too high. So demand is definitely there, it, The but it's just get, finding somebody who has a thresher will come to your farm. So it's basically the, the biggest barrier to use is the low uh, level of availability at this time. Uh, one of your earlier comments, you mentioned passing off the innovation and making sure that's being shared across countries. Do you have a network in place that helps you to reach new countries or what does that look like? So we work with, um, so the Soybean Innovation Lab works always with in-country hosts. So we are invited to a country for somebody who recognizes the need for mechanization in their area and who already has a set, you know, a network of farmers um, and that kind of thing. And then we help them develop the, the network of fabricators. And then we also network all of our fabricators together. So like we have a Facebook page, WhatsApp groups, those kind of things, so that they can share ideas and issues. Um, so there, we, we mostly work with smaller manufacturers. There is, of course, larger manufacturers also across Africa. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of, um, of interplay between the public and the private uh, sectors in developing mechanization. Great. Another audience question here is asking about the biggest barriers to access to credit. So that's interesting. So right now, interest rate. So like I said, 30% is not atypical and it is truly impossible to pay back credit at 30% interest rate. Um, I have seen it as low as maybe 14% at a credit union. Um, so we took one of our threshing um, fabricators groups to a bank and talked to them one time. And basically what the bank told us was that if you have the amount of money you need to borrow in a bank account, we'll loan it to you. So, you know, if they had that amount of money, they wouldn't need to borrow the money. So it, it, it's banking is just, and the reason that's like this is because um, it's hard to get, uh, it's hard to get um, people not to default on loans. So they, that's why the interest rate is so high. And of course, having a high interest rate makes people default on loans. So it's a, it's a horrible circular situation. Um, the the microcredit, um, and of course, there is also public funded, like USAID funded credit. Um, still, it, a lot of people are working in the informal sector in Africa. And um, you have to really be a part of the formal sector, like prove that you pay taxes and, and that kind of thing to get loans. And the, in some countries, the informal sector still may make up 95% of jobs and work. So it's that, so there is a big divide between the formal and the informal sector. Um, and by informal sector, I mean the ones that haven't declared themselves as businesses, they don't have a business license uh, and they don't pay taxes. And a lot of reasons they do that is because taxes are also incredibly high because Governments need money, and the formal sector that they can pull the taxes from is very small, so they have to have very high tax rates. So there's a lot of issues there with 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 credit, and um, and as you guys know, anybody that you know grew up in America, an American farm, you know that U.S. farmers credit is like your best friend. You know, you don't necessarily have the money to buy all your seed and your fertilizer every year. You go to the bank, they give it to you, pay them back each year. So we really we really run our society on credit, especially farming, and um, the for, the formation of cooperatives and the access to credit is what make part of what made American farming great, um, and that is really really a horrible hindrance in African agriculture. So are the women's groups that you mentioned are they formed as kind of like co-ops then? Yeah, they form around something called the Village Savings and Loan Association, where they they basically save they have a they have like a, a, a steel box where they save money and then they work as a group to figure out how that money will get used um so it doesn't really collect interest although when they get bigger it's they could potentially put it in a bank or some sort of investment vehicle but really the best way to collect interest is to do something with that money that makes money that makes profit such as a service provision business um so right now a lot of them will use that money for uh, you know buying seed or that kind of thing so they, they try to use it for, for things that so while they don't collect interest, but will make a profit and then they can 
put the profit back into the savings. So they work as basically cooperatives. Farmers cooperatives are fairly um, important in Africa because it gives it gives people much more clout in the market. Um, and so if one guy is growing soybeans off in you know, some village in rural Mozambique, he's not going to get a truck or an aggregator to come pick up his grain. But if the whole village is growing and if they all get, band together and form a cooperative, they will get a truck out there to, to pick that grain up and buy it from them. Excellent. Well, thank you, Carrie, for the presentation and the discussion and the Q&A from all of the um, attendees as well. So it's uh, time to close today's webinar. We really appreciate your presentation and we thank our audience for being here too. When you exit Zoom, you'll see a post webinar survey will load in your browser. In fact, it may have already loaded. Uh, please consider responding as we'll use the results to improve the webinar experience and brainstorm future webinar topics. Again, you should receive a recorded copy of today's webinar via your email within about a day from now. And we'll also include a link to the slides that you can download if you'd like to have a look at any of the pictures again. Um, our next Engaging for Missouri webinar is scheduled for Wednesday, September 8th. Dr. Ray Massey, who's an agricultural and applied economics extension professor, will speak about emerging carbon markets in agriculture. Again, thank you for joining us and have a great Wednesday. Thanks again, Carrie. Thank you, guys.